So external obliques, so origin, starts up at the ribs, the lower eight ribs, and then they travel down. So they come down at an angle and they descend and they are going to um, start to insert onto the um, abdominal aponeurosis. Now, also, when you look at how, I always think it's really cool because when you look at how the serratus anterior dovetails with that superior part of external obliques, um, there is a fascial blending that happens between that serratus anterior on the same side. So like the right uh, serratus anterior fascially blending with the right external oblique, because that's a really cool um, relationship that they have. Then I'm also going to show you how the uh, external oblique as it descends and comes down into the uh, insertion, how you're going to start to see how it fascially blends with the internal oblique on the opposite side. So we create almost like this sash that goes down from top all the way down from the right side, if we're looking at right external oblique and right serratus anterior, and it comes all the way down, and then it crosses and goes over to the left side and down to that left hip area. The insertion is going to be of external obliques. Like I said, once it comes down from um, those lower eight ribs and it descends, um, it is going to ha have insertions on the uh, abdominal aponeurosis, which is that sheet of connective tissue that's um, over the front of like that rectus abdominis. Um, and then also it will have a bony attachment at the iliac crest. So as you can see in that picture, sometimes people think, well, how is it, how are those upper fibers going all the way down into the iliac crest? Wouldn't that create like, you know, almost like a complete up and down fiber direction, but we're looking for um, something that is more of a diagonal. Well, that's why you have some of the insertion being that abdominal aponeurosis, which is over that rectus abdominis. So some of those upper fibers will use the abdominal aponeurosis as an insertion, while some of the lower fibers that are coming from some of the lower um, ribs are going to use that, uh, that iliac crest. They'll just go to what's closest for them, but yet still be able to keep that, um, that, that diagonal fiber direction. So what does it do? Um, external oblique. So you've got a right and a left external oblique. So if you look at bilaterally, meaning both sides working at the same time, the right and the left external oblique. And on the screen right there, um, that's showing a right external oblique. So if Pay attention to that right side. The left side is actually the um, internal oblique on that opposite side. So we're looking at where Dr. Osar is kind of um, putting for that right, right there. That's going to be the external oblique that we're talking about. So when you are talking about both sides of your external oblique, both right side external uh, external oblique and left side external oblique contracting together, you get trunk and spine flexion. So that, that bending forward kind of uh, action. When we look at the unilateral actions of external oblique, um, they will do ipsilateral flexion, same side, side bending, if you want to make a little note of that. Meaning, ipsilateral always means the same side. So that means your right external oblique is going to be able to laterally flex or side bend your vertebral column to the right. All right, that's the easy part. Your left external oblique will be able to side bend um, your vertebral column to the um, left side. Now, what gets a little tricky though with external oblique is that it does contralateral rotation, all right, of the, of the spine or the vertebral column. So your right external oblique will rotate you to the left, all right? Your right external oblique will rotate you to the left. Your left external oblique will rotate you to the right. All right, so, and I'll give you a good mnemonic for that as I'm talking, um, looking at George here uh, in a bit. So the other thing bilaterally that the um, external obliques do or that they can do is because they're located um, on the front, more of the front of that bowl or that pelvis, um, when they contract, they can create a uh, posterior um, pelvic rotation. Okay, so we're going to start with the external oblique. And the external oblique will be represented by the green, all right, by the green um, tape right here. 
And with the external oblique, remember we said that what it does is it is going to start from the ribs, the lower eight ribs. And actually over here, I'm gonna show you on George where you see these red spots here. So here, 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 these little stripes here, these are representing where the external oblique is gonna originate from. Just, you can barely see them underneath there, right? And they do bring it all the way back here to that, those two floating ribs. So its origin comes from here, and then it comes down, and some of these upper fibers are going to insert onto that abdominal aponeuroses. And then some of these lower fibers are the ones that are gonna come down and insert onto the anterior iliac crest, um, so you've got this, this, what I try to do when I teach this is I think about the fiber direction, right? Like how it's coming down, because that helps you to understand to what its relationship is to the opposing side, internal oblique, um, and also in terms of what it does with rotation. So this here on the green, again, thinking about coming from the ribs, the lower eight ribs, and then coming down to the abdominal aponeuroses, I kind of had a hard time taping it down here onto the um, anterior iliac crest. So kind of just have to imagine, there's my finger, okay, coming down, especially these guys down through here, kind of crossing. So now I'm going to move to myself, all right, human, human George, right? And here's how, got move this down here, whoa. All right, so here on myself, all right, the white is going to represent that abdominal aponeuroses. This, I was writing this while Dr. Osir was talking, and if you see, it says external oblique over here. And so this oh, is. Oh, I, I thought those were my initials there. Oh, oh my God, it does. <laughs> I never thought about that. Yeah, just just so I know. So the next webinar I do, I just change it. You know, I just do webinars with, with chiropractors all day long. This is Evan Osar's one. No, <laughs> so, so when I think about the fiber direction of the external obliques, think about it as, as if you're putting your hands in your pocket. Like if you had a hoodie on and you're putting your hands in your pocket, that's the fiber direction of external obliques. So from the ribs, going down to the abdominal aponeuroses, going down into that anterior iliac crest. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to say with this guy. Oh, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. EO, that's why I did put EO there. It could be Evan Osar, but you know what? I picture it as meaning two things. Now it can mean three. Evan Osar, it can mean external obliques, but it can remind you the direction that your external obliques will rotate you. E-O, exact opposite. So exact opposite side that this external oblique will rotate you. So this is my left external oblique, all right? And it is going to be able to rotate me to the right. right? And I can bring this, and I know Dr. Osar is gonna do this as well, um, but if I look at the fiber direction of these external obliques, Right. And then I look at this again, this is left. Notice that when I rotate my torso to the right, the attachment sites get closer together. The brain is telling this muscle to shorten and contract and create this rotation to the opposite side. Grab a, a yoga strap and or band. If you have it, if you don't have it, no worries. You can also use a, a bathrobe strap as well or a belt if you don't have that. Just grab something. If you don't have anything, use your hands. But the reason why we don't like to use your hands is because a lot of your clients have, don't have enough shoulder rotation or motion, and they just tighten their shoulders up if they use their hands. But you could use your hands if you have very mobile shoulders. Now, before we get started, let's do our self-assessment. So I want you to stand up and sit back down towards the edge of your chair, sit on your sit bones, and just get relatively aligned. So again, don't force your, your posture, but just get yourself stacked up because if your clients are slumping down like this, you're not gonna get a great rotation assessment. So I'm gonna sit on my sit bones, sit towards the edge of my chair, nice and tall. And now what I want you to do is cross your hands over top your shoulders. Now, what I want you to do is just Go slowly with this because a lot of your clients will go fast. They'll just go, uh, 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 uh. yeah, I don't feel any different side to side, but they're going too fast. So let's do it really slow and specifically and methodically. So you're here, rotate to your right side, go slow. And that's about how far I go to my right, come back to center. So we always come back to center and stop. 
Now go left, and you can see, like, ugh, can't get as far left. Do it a couple more times just so you get a sense for your own side. Rotate right. And for me, it's a little bit easier. It feels freer to me. Come back. Rotate left. Uh, yeah, I can force it. But here's what I have to do. Here's what a lot of your clients will do. I can't go left. So what I do is I do this. I start to translate and flex and rotate. I'm going to turn this down just a little bit. So I can't get left. This is where I stop. So I'll either do one or two things. I'll do this. This is the most common thing. Or I'll do this where I, uh, where I arch up and over. So it's not pure rotation. So let me try that one more time. Right, pretty easy and free. Come back to center. Left, ugh, real restricted. And I can come further if I compensate. So do that on yourself and see if you find a side that's restricted. Okay, because I want you to focus on a side that's more restricted. Okay, so my left rotation is more restricted. So here's what I want you to do with your strap now. If you don't have a strap, what I want you to do is don't put your hands like this because that, that will lock up your shoulders a little bit. Put your hands like this across your body like this. This is how you'll breathe if you don't have a strap. If you do have a strap, I got my strap here. I'm gonna wrap it around my rib cage. I'm gonna go right around where I felt most restriction. So for me, I, I did feel like some mid back restriction right about my chest level. So that's where I'm gonna wrap my strap. I'm gonna hold my strap in opposing hands like this. Nice and relaxed shoulders, wide shoulders. And now let's breathe. So we'll go ahead and breathe into your strap. Pause. And breathe out. Adriana, have a great day. Thank you for being on. You'll have the recording after this is over. You'll watch as I breathe in. Expand into the strap. As I breathe out, you'll see the, the relaxing and narrowing of the ribcage. You have to align your client appropriately. If you notice, I'm going to align my head and neck at thoracopelvic pelvic cylinder. I'm also going to elevate myself on a stack of pads because otherwise my pelvis will not be neutral. So the right there, if you notice my thoracopelvic cylinder is aligned, my pelvis is level and neutral. Again, just like Melissa did with the ball, I'm going to rotate on an axis, maintaining my pelvis where it is. So this is pretty much pure trunk rotation. Oops, sorry. Let me turn the volume down. And again, the arms stay in front of the rib cage. I'm not rotating outside of my trunk rotation. My pelvis, I should say my pelvis is staying stationary. My arms are staying in front of my chest. You'll see it from the front as I rotate from the front. Generally, we'll have our clients rotate their head with the motion. So let me set it up from the front here. So again, I'll align that thoracopelvic cylinder, step and set up the position. So right there, my arms will stay right here. I will not move my arms from this position as I rotate. I'm gonna rotate, stop. If you notice, my arms are still in front of my chest. My pelvis and lumbar spine still face forward. I'm teaching pure axial rotation. So rotation around an axis. I'm training pure, relatively pure. It's not 100% pure, but mostly pure thoracic rotation. That's where we need and want our clients to be rotating from, not their lumbar spine. Coming back to center and holding. So that's a start position. It's also the stop position. Rotate, come back to center, stop. Do not allow your client just to zigzag and just shift all over the place. Uh, uh, uh.